All right, uh, continuing our uh, series of short videos on kinetics, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the theory of uh, kinetics. And uh, there's sort of two theories for these, although your book just considers one of them and kind of folds the other one in together. And they really are. They're so... Um, so uh, complementary theories that there's just isn't isn't like there's a competition that one theory is better than the other. They both work together very well, even though they take a little bit of uh, a different approach to them. And it's this kind of a unified approach, but that's okay. <clears throat> so the theory uh, that we generally operate on is called collision theory, which says that for molecules to react, that they have to collide. Okay and that uh, the rate at which a reaction happens is going to uh, depend on three factors. Uh, one of them is how frequently re, uh, things collide, that is how, uh, what, uh, what's the rate of collisions per time. And so you can think about this, that uh, if your concentration was increased, right? Um, if we increase our concentration, that's going to increase our uh, rate of reaction, right? That makes sense. You kind of know that instinctively. And then the other thing that this uh, also suggests is that, uh, you know, temperature increasing might also increase the rate, although we'll see another reason to explain that as well. But, you know, typically the rule of thumb is that if you increase uh, the rate of reaction 10 degrees Celsius, uh, or sorry, if you increase the temperature of reaction 10 degrees Celsius, the rate doubles. Now, um, and we saw back in the gas law chapter about how uh, the motion of gas particles depended on temperature, and that's true of motion of particles in solution as well. All right, now there's an, a factor that's called, the second factor is called the orientation factor. It's that uh, the atoms have to collide in the proper way. Um, so we've got a figure down here, the 1713 is, is the uh, figure for the reaction of carbon monoxide with oxygen to make carbon dioxide and um, uh, another, um, well actually what it is, I'm sorry, it's carbon dioxide, two carbon dioxides reacting with oxygen to make, uh, uh, sorry, two carbon monoxides reacting with oxygen to make two carbon dioxides. So um, how is this going to start? Um, the way it's going to start is with a carbon monoxide and an oxygen colliding, possibly. And uh, you see in the top reaction there, if the carbon monoxide and the oxygen collide in a way where uh, the oxygens are touching, that's likely to lead to no reaction. But if we collide in the second manner where the oxygen uh, is collides with the carbon, then you can have a transfer of an oxygen to the carbon monoxide and get a CO2, and then this is a, an extra oxygen, which is then going to, you know, hopefully go on and collide with another carbon monoxide and give us another CO2, kind of is what, what happens with that. Uh, but that's just an illustration of the orientation factor. Um, and uh, so the collision's got to be oriented in the proper way. And then finally, the collision has to occur with adequate energy to let the reaction happen. You know, if you've ever been in a car collision, you know there are car collisions where really no damage is done because you weren't going fast enough, didn't have enough uh, momentum to have the collision uh, be a very uh, bad collision. Um, then, of course, there are times when that's not the case and you're, you're talking thousands of dollars in repairs. Um, I once hit a hit a dump truck. Uh, I wasn't wasn't out of first gear. Couldn't have been going more than five miles an hour when I hit that dump truck. I think I did eighteen hundred dollar eighteen hundred dollars damage to my car. <clears throat> I think I scratched some of the grease off of the dump truck. I don't think I hurt it much because it was so massive and it was still anyway. Um, but you got to have enough energy uh, for the collision to take place. Now. Um, there is an iconic graph here. This graph that we're looking at now in figure 1714 um, is, uh, I, see, I hear lots of people nowadays calling these potential energy graphs. Um, I call it, uh, I learned to call it a reaction coordinate diagram. So that's usually what I'll call it is a reaction coordinate diagram.
But potential energy graph is uh, not a bad one either. It is a graph, not a diagram. This extent of reaction is what I call the reaction coordinate. It's, a, it's an arbitrary um, progress of the reaction. It's not time exactly. Uh, this is about a single event happening in a reaction. So it would be time only for that single reaction event happening. You know, one molecule of A and one molecule of B are reactants getting together to react and form our products, C and D. And uh, in kinetics, what we're interested in is this hump in the middle. And uh, up at the top of the hump, we have something called the transition state. And the competing uh, kinetic theory is sometimes called the transition state theory. And uh, the transition state theory talks about this energy, which is always a positive energy here called E sub A. That is the activation energy. And it's the energy that has to be put into the reaction to make it happen. Uh, every reaction has a barrier to the reaction happening like this, an activation energy. It's just in some cases um, the activation energy is low enough that the, the energy that, that's present uh, in the environment at, the, at that temperature is, is enough to, to let it get over the hump. Um, Sometimes you uh, you do things to uh, to 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 deal with this. You try to prevent reactions by cooling them down. Uh, this is why you put the milk in the refrigerator, right? If you put the milk in the refrigerator, it cools the milk down. Uh, the reactions that happen to make the milk go bad are slowed down because there's not enough energy there for them to surmount this activation energy barrier. It takes them longer to do that. Um, there is an equation to describe this is called the Arrhenius equation. I just copied the, that from the book. Little k is the is the rate constant of a reaction. A is a term that's called the pre-exponential term, and uh, we won't deal with that very much at all in this class. Uh, it's not got any kind of uh, great insight. E here is the uh, the number e that is the base of the um, the natural logs um, that is uh, something around um, let's see if I can get this for you here it's something around 2.7 I think 2.718 right so it's 2.718 and it's defined on out about that it's the it's the base though of the natural log uh, ln function not the log log but the ln log um, and then that is raised to the negative activation energy divided by R times T, where R is the gas constant, but it's in the units of usually joules, uh, so it's 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And the T is the temperature in Kelvin. And uh, A, the pre-exponential term, just carries the units. Uh, this again is the pre-exponential term. And it carries whatever units K has. So if it's a first order uh, rate constant, it's reciprocal seconds and so on and so forth. That equation uh, has a logarithm version of it. If you take the natural log of everything, you get the uh, equation that you'll see down here, L and K, well, let me, let me spread it out for you here a little bit. L and K is equal to L and A, and, um, and then negative E sub A over RT. That is the uh, log version of the exponential version of this uh, Arrhenius equation. If we take this, we can break this out a little further uh, and get this kind of equation right here where we separate out 1 over t and negative e sub a over r and turn it around a little bit and when you do that that uh, gives you a straight line equation where l and k could be y uh, negative e sub a over r is your slope 1 over t is your x if you plot 1 over t on the x-axis and then the y-intercept would be l n a and uh, so we'll see an example of that down here um, this is, uh, there's a both uh, over here, this is a 
Excel spreadsheet that you can download and work with if you'd like to. Uh, what you see next to it is an image of that Excel spreadsheet. I took some data from a problem here where I had uh, uh, reaction rates that were measured at different temperatures ranging from 555 Kelvin up to 700 Kelvin and then you see those uh, K values go from 6.23 times 10 to the negative 7th uh, all the way up to 2.01 times 10 to the negative 3 uh, at the 700 Kelvin. And um, then I took the log of uh, the uh, the rate constant and I took 1 over 10. I plotted these on this axis and you see the points down there. And this again is an Excel. And uh, I was able to fit that to a straight line uh, curve. And you see the equation for it at the bottom where we have uh, this uh, slope is right here. So that slope, uh, I was able to uh, uh, identify, you know, if I take the uh, uh, value of R and, and multiply it and uh, by the slope and then also multiply negative 1 over there, I get that the activation energy is, uh, that's actually should be positive 100. And 80 kilojoules basically is the uh, is the activation energy. Again, you can never have a negative one. I think I just forgot to take that negative sign out when I multiply by the value of R. Um, the uh, graph up here above 1715, I want to come back to. Um, this is a graph of uh, molecular speeds. This is sometimes called the Boltzmann distribution. And what the x-axis is, is kinetic energy or speed. Um, kinetic energy, of course, is one-half times the mass times the velocity squared. So kinetic energy and velocity pretty much graph out the same way. Um, and then the y-axis is the number of molecules that have that particular speed. So if you're, if you're in a sample of gas like you are right now, um, there are different... Uh, gas molecules around you moving at different speeds. They're not all moving at the same speed. Most of them are moving at the most common speed, the peak of that curve. Some of them are going really slow. Some of them are going faster. Uh, and so if we have a reaction and we have our molecules moving, uh, some of them are uh, above the activation energy. And you see they have two cases here. Uh, the first case here is where we have a higher activation energy. Maybe that um, is uh, is a reaction that's not catalyzed and then if we can add a catalyst one way a catalyst will work is it'll lower the activation energy and the area under the curve uh, between those lines and the end of the curve that area gives you the number of molecules um, and again that's suggesting the use of uh, integral calculus which we're not really doing but you can kind of see that uh, the area of uh, the higher activation energy isn't as big as the area for the lower activation energy which means that the lower activation energy would have a faster uh, rate constant it would go faster in the second case we've got uh, two temperatures temperature one is in red and temperature two is in black so we've got two curves representing that and uh, so temperature one might be the temperature in the refrigerator and temperature two might be the temperature out on the counter and uh, you see what happens uh, is that as things warm up the the, the curve of the distribution of the energies um, flattens and moves to the right a little bit uh, and so what happens is if you look at the area under this curve again out here for this activation energy the uh, one for the higher energy case has got more uh, than the one for the lower uh, temperature case. Uh, so that explains why the milk goes bad faster sitting out on the counter than it does uh, in the refrigerator. So um, there is uh, a, a final uh, shot to make about this. This is what's called the two-point uh, Arrhenius equation. It's the same equation. It's just set up uh, looking at two temperatures where you have at T1, you have a rate constant of K1. At T2, you have a rate constant of K2. And, um, you know, the algebra works out. If you put it all together, it does, it does make sense. It's a little tricky because of the, you 
turning signs around and, and changing whether you do 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2 or vice versa. Uh, it's the way you absorb the negative sign in front of E sub A. But uh, this is the equation. So what you could be given in a, in a problem is you could be given uh, these four data points, two temperatures with their two rate constants, and ask you to get the activation energy. Or you could be given the activation energy uh, and uh, a rate at one particular temperature and then be asked to predict um, the rate at another temperature or the temperature at which the rate would fall below a certain value or go above a certain value. So there are different ways you could you could uh, have to play with this. One thing to remember when you're working with this is that ln of k1 over k2 can always be converted to ln of k1 minus ln of k2. And, um, and if I want to get rid of the ln, then I have to do uh, e to the, you know, raise everything to the power of e. So e to the ln of k1 over k2 is k1 over k2. Um, we would then have to say that's equal to e uh, to the um, e sub a over r times 1 over t2 minus 1 over t1. So all of that would be raised as a power of e. Uh, and you don't see that form as often, but you may have to when you're processing this work with something like that. So anyway, so that's a brief overview of uh, kinetic theory, and uh, we'll equip you to do some calculations, deal with some graphs, uh, and uh, so I hope that helps.